this morning we come to Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 7, and I've titled this sermon and titled this passage, passage, Saved by Grace, Judged by Works. It can be a bit of a confusing combination of phrases, can't it? And we, we're coming to this passage, and this is what has often been a challenging and much debated passage in God's word for hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of years. We have to ask the question, and you'll see if you haven't read it already in preparing for this morning, you'll see that we have to ask this question, is Paul here in Romans 2, verses 6 through 11, contradicting what he said back in chapter 1? The salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Has, has Paul had a bit of amnesia and forgotten what he wrote just 20 or 30 verses ago? Is Paul teaching in these verses a salvation that comes from works? Were the Catholics right the whole time? Did Martin Luther and the Reformers just not catch this passage here in Romans 2? These are questions that we have to ask as we come here, and you'll see that we have to examine this relationship between faith and works, salvation by grace and judgment by works. And so that is the topic that we turn our attention to now this morning as we come to our next passage in Romans 2. I want to ask you to follow along with me as I read the passage, and I'm going to start back in verse 1. We covered verses 1 through 5 last week, but I think it's important to catch the flow of argument that Paul is going through. So look at verse 1 of chapter 2. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you'll escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. The reason I wanted to start reading back in verse 1, like I said, is so that you get the full scope of the argument in this passage. We saw there in verses 1 through 5 last week, as we called this group of people the deceived moralists, that we saw how Paul examined and looked at these religious hypocrites and showed how really they were doing nothing other than storing up wrath for themselves on the day of God's judgment. And now in verse 6, he's going to turn his attention to looking at that day of judgment when that wrath is going to be poured out. And his main point in these verses, in verses 6 through 11, are to show that both Jews and Greeks, both the religious and the non-religious, both the outwardly moral and the outwardly immoral, they will all be judged by the same standard on that day of judgment. His point here in the flow of the argument is to show that the Jews will not enter into heaven because of any Jewishness, Jewishness that they have, any amount of religious activity or rule keeping. Rather, both for the Jew and the Gentile alike, both for the Jew and the Greek alike, the entrance into heaven and the casting into hell will be decided according to the same judgment, according to the same standard. That's the main point of the text. And if we understand that, we could stop now, close our Bibles, pray, and go home. Right? That, that, that is the main point that he is driving home. And we could have probably the shortest Grace Bible Church service that I've ever been a part of here at this church. But there's also a huge question that we come to as we read through those verses and it's a question that has been pointed to by many people, and many people have used this passage to argue that Paul is teaching here salvation by works. 
So we have to ask ourselves that question. When he says things like verse 6, he, being God, will render to each according to his works. And then when he says in verse 7, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, those who do that, he will give eternal life. We have to ask, what do we do with these verses? How do we understand these verses? Well, the first thing I want us to do is to uh, pair back a bit from this passage and look at the rest of God's word and see two twin truths that we see running like threads throughout all of God's word. I think this is the first and most important step for us as we do that first hermeneutical principle of letting scripture interpret scripture. And as we see these two things, then I want to come back to Romans 2 and see what Paul is saying. So here are two clear scriptural truths that we see throughout God's word. Number one, we are saved by grace. Scripture is abundantly clear throughout, especially spelled out in the New Testament, that our salvation, our being made right with God, our being justified before him is based on grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Apart from anything you or I do, apart from any works on our part. I've listed there several passages on your handout. You can turn with me if you want. I know it's a lot of turning, but I do want to read several of them for you this morning just to show you this consistent teaching throughout God's word. We see it first throughout the book of Romans, Romans 3, 28. Paul says, we hold that, no one, or we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Pretty, pretty straightforward there. Fast forward to chapter, chapter 4, verse 5. To the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Go one more chapter forward in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then go down to verse 9. Again, he exalts that our reconciliation that we have through Christ is by faith. Verse 9, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. So we're going to see this over and over throughout Romans, Paul reminds us, and it's crystal clear, that our salvation, our being made right with God, is by faith alone, apart from any works. And it's not just Romans that teaches this. We see this throughout the New Testament. Listen to Paul writing in 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16, of those or of the saving work of Jesus given to those who believe in him. He writes, quote, verse 15, The saying is trustworthy, deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. 2 Timothy 1.9 says something very similar. Titus 3, 5, Jesus saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. And finally, perhaps most clearly, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Many of you have these verses memorized. By grace you have been saved through what? Through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. You see, Scripture is abundantly clear throughout God's word that there is one and only one way of salvation, one and only one way of being made right with God. That is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. There is no amount of good works that can make us right with God. There's no amount of obedience that can make up for our disobedience and our sin against God. Only the finished work of Jesus on the cross, received by faith, applied to us by the grace of God, can atone for our sins and reconcile us to the Father. That is the gospel. And that is clear throughout God's word. And, and we as evangelical Christians were usually, usually pretty strong at that point, right? That is, in fact, what makes us, by definition, evangelical. We believe in the gospel, we trust in the gospel, and there is one and only one way of salvation. But there's another twin truth that runs throughout scripture, 
And this is the one that often trips us up in passages like this here in Romans 2. And that is the truth that we are judged by works. Or or better said, we are judged in accordance with our works. It's a much better word there than by. We are judged in accordance with our works. That is the truth that Paul here is reminding us of in Romans 2. And it is a theme that also runs throughout Scripture. Listen to Jesus in Matthew 7. 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So who is it there that will enter the kingdom of heaven, according to Jesus in that passage? The one who does the will of my Father. Matthew 12, verses 33 through 37, Jesus teaches here about what makes a good tree a good tree that bears good fruit, what makes a bad tree a bad tree it bears bad fruit. And then he ends in verse 36 and 37 saying this, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned." Again, John chapter 5, Jesus speaks of the day and hour when the dead will be be raised and the final judgment will ensue. Listen to what he says in verses 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Notice the similarity to what he says here in verse 29 to Romans 2. They will come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. That sounds very similar to our language here in Romans 2. And it's not just Jesus in the Gospels that speaks in these categories. We see Paul himself who wrote this epistle, that uh, we wrote this epistle of Romans, who wrote so many of the epistles that we quoted from in our first truth, that salvation is by grace alone. He also says many things about this judgment by works. Listen to Galatians 6, verses 8 and 9. For the one who sows to his own flesh, speaking of a a sinful lifestyle, right, will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. We're going to come back to this passage in a moment because it is a, a very helpful one in understanding what Paul is saying here in Romans 2. Again, Romans 14 Verses 10 through 12, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or or you, why do you despise your brother? We'll all stand before the judgment seat of God. For as it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. Verse 12, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. And then there are some encouragement and warning passages like 2 Timothy 4, 2 Corinthians 11, where Paul just in passing assumes this fact that there will be a time at the judgment when people will be judged by their works. And then finally, of course, we have James. In James chapter 2, who speaks of a faith without works being dead, and he ends that passage in verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, obviously, we could open up a huge can of worms to try to understand that passage fully, and we will as we come to Romans chapter 3. But the point here is that we see these twin truths running throughout Scripture. The question for us then is how do we fit them together? How do we reconcile what seems perhaps on the surface to be contradictory truths? Specifically this morning in Romans 2, we have to understand what Paul is talking about here when he says in verse 6, he will render to each according to his works. Now, there's basically been two uh, ways to interpret this passage, two ways to deal with this passage. The the first way, and, and many people, perhaps you have been taught this way, try to interpret this passage by saying that Paul is speaking in hypothetical terms. He's speaking in hypothetical categories. That is, Paul is saying in verses 6 through 11 that eternal life would be based on perfect obedience if anybody had it. Right, so, so this interpretation is saying basically that Paul is taking these religious Jews, 
talking to them on their own turf, on their own kind of works-based salvation position, and showing that on judgment day, God will render to each one according to their works. And if they have perfect obedience, if they are perfect in their rule following and their religious duties, and they're seeking after glory and honor and immortality, then God would, in fact, grant them eternal life. But nobody does. The only, and so the only way to eternal life is by faith in Christ. This is that kind of hypothetical interpretation. This is how I personally was taught to interpret this passage early in my Christian life. The second way that people have interpreted this passage, which is the position that I take and I'm going to present this morning, is that God never promised in his word, and God doesn't promise in his word here in this passage, that eternal life is on the basis of good deeds, but rather, he always makes good deeds be the evidence of faith that truly unites us in Christ, and that faith is the basis of eternal life. And so, Paul is speaking here in this passage of the fruits or the evidences of a truly born-again, saved follower of Jesus, whose life will manifest a life of good works because his or her salvation and the sanctifying work of the Spirit in his or her life is what happens. So, so just let's, let's take verse 7, and you can see how these two different schools of interpretation would handle this. Verse 7, to, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. So if you take this passage and take this verse to, to mean it's hypothetical, the first group would say that what Paul is saying here is that God would give eternal life on the basis of perfect obedience if anyone had it, but nobody does. And so Paul's point in this verse is simply to stress the hopelessness of man without the gospel of God's grace. The other group, what I'm going to argue this morning, says that it means that God here does not give eternal life to those who persevere in obedience, not, not because this obedience is, is perfect, not because it's the basis or merit of eternal life, but because saving faith always produces a changed life by the power of the Holy Spirit such that true believers do persevere in doing good. And so it's on the basis of that evidence that Paul is now issuing this judgment. Now, you might be sitting there just thoroughly confused. Right, just kind of eyes glossed over. I get it. But it's, an, it's a very important distinction to make here and a very important question to ask. So let me give you a few reasons why I think this is a better way of understanding these verses than the hypothetical. Let me just offer you quickly four, five reasons, and then we're going to jump into the verses. First, simply to me, these verses just don't come across as hypothetical. Right, just in the natural reading of the verses, as, as we read through the passage in its context, they don't seem hypothetical. They seem to be straightforward. Sometimes in Paul's writings, we come to a passage where it's very clear that he's being hypothetical or, or, or maybe even a bit sarcastic. I don't know if that's the right word to use of, of Paul and God's word, but it's very clear he's perhaps poking fun at another position that he's then going to respond to. Uh, and present another key truth. But that's not how these verses read. There's nothing in the surrounding context or in the passage that points to these verses being hypothetical, in my opinion. Second, I think verses 4 and 5 that we looked at last week seem to give us a bit of a clue that Paul doesn't have a perfect obedience in mind here as the path to eternal life. Look at what he says back in verse 4. Not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. Notice that key word. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath. Notice there the importance of repentance in the immediately preceding verses to our passage. The, the repentant heart, or, or lack thereof, is the thing that Paul is pointing to in that passage as the reason for why they are storing up wrath. We could look at the flip side of that and say, if they had a repentant heart, then they would what? They would not be storing up wrath. Paul is not thinking here of an all or nothing sort of righteousness, an all or nothing uh, 
sort of obedience. Rather, he's thinking about God's kindness and mercy and his willingness to forgive people of their sins if they would repent of their sin and turn to him for mercy. No, no, he doesn't yet go deep into what the basis of that mercy is in Christ's death. That's coming in chapter 3 and onward, but it does seem that he's connecting here, verse 7, persevering in doing good to probably include a repentant heart that depends on mercy and grace for the forgiveness of sins. The third reason that I don't think these verses are hypothetical, it comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. Hold your place there in Romans 2 and flip to those verses very quickly. Romans 8, starting in verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Now notice the conditional clause here in verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So what is it that's at stake here in Romans 8, verses 12 and 13? What's at stake is life and death, right? Eternal life and eternal death. And what Paul is describing in these verses is the path that leads to eternal life. And what is that path? If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You will have eternal life. This is the same point as verse 7 here in chapter 2. In chapter 2, Paul says that God will give eternal life to those who persevere in doing good. In Romans 8, he says God will give eternal life to those who put to death the deeds of the body. And how is it that we put to death the deeds of the body? According to Romans 8, it is by the Spirit. This is how we persevere in doing good. We live by the Spirit through faith. The good deeds do not earn eternal life. The good deeds do not merit eternal life. They are simply the fruit of depending on the power of the Spirit in faith that then vindicate our uh, being entered into eternal life. Uh, fourth, it seems that Paul is likely quoting here in Romans 2, or referencing at least Psalm 60, 62 in his language. You could go home, maybe jot down on your outline Psalm 62. Go read that psalm in full this afternoon as you think about this topic. But David ends that psalm with these words in verse 12. For you, God, will render to a man according to his work. It's very similar, same language right here in verse 6. He will render to each one according to his work work. Now notice when you read Psalm 62, notice what the works are that people have done there in that psalm. What you're going to see in that psalm is David is contrasting two different groups of people. Those who on the one hand plot against the king, verses 3 and 4, who lie and say with their lips the uh, opposite with, or say and do with their lips and do the opposite of their heart. They are just like the group of people that Paul looked at last week in verses 1 through 5. They are the hypocrites. The other group, though, are those who, quote, rest in God alone. They are those who know that their salvation, quote, comes from him there in that psalm. They are those who say, like verse 7, on God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. So what is it that that group has done? What are the works of that group that God is going to render on judgment day? Well, the work that they have done is to make God the center of their lives by faith through the Spirit. This is not a works-based righteousness where one group of people has done more good than the other, and the other group of people has done more evil than the other, and then God on judgment day is going to weigh the balance and give eternal life to the good group and eternal death to the bad group. Rather, it's a contrast between one group of people who has placed self at the center of their life, and so all their sinful deeds and fruit flow from that, and another group of people who have placed God at the center of their life. And their repentant and faith-fueled lives bear the fruit of that. That seems to be the context, the Old Testament context, that Paul is drawing from here in Romans chapter 2. And finally, I said we would come back to this passage in Galatians 6. But Galatians 6, 8 and 9 
is very telling and very similar to our passage here in Romans 2. You can, you can turn there if you'd like to see the, the parallels. But watch in these verses how eternal life comes to Christians. So Paul is writing to the church here, and he writes this, Galatians 6, verse 8. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. Corruption being the opposite of immortality, right? Right? But the one who sows to the Spirit, think of the language we just read in Romans 8, right? If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap eternal life if we do not give up. This is essentially identical to the argument in Romans chapter 2. In Romans 2, God gives eternal life to those who persevere in doing good. That's the language there in Romans 2, right? In Galatians 6, if we don't grow weary of doing good, that's the same thing as persevering in doing good, right? We will reap. We will reap what? We will reap eternal life. Listen to how Piper summarizes all of this and that passage. In none of these texts, Piper says, does it say that eternal life is earned by or merited by, or based on good deeds. They simply say, in effect, that the final verdict of eternal life will accord with good deeds. They go together. And the reason they go together is not that works has replaced faith or that merit has replaced grace, but because the gospel of justification by faith is the power of God unto salvation. It is not a weak thing. The gospel does not come into a life and leave it under the dominion of sin. It comes in the power of the Holy Spirit. And where it is believed, trusted, cherished, it produces what Paul calls the obedience of faith. And eternal life always accords with that. So that's how we're going to approach this passage in the few moments we have left this morning. I know that's a lot. That's in one sense our introduction to the passage. I just had dinner with Kevin not long ago. So that's my Kevin Hurt introduction to this passage, right? But, but in all seriousness, it's, it's important for us to have this distinction and understand what Paul's talking about here as we now look at the verses, lest we understand them incorrectly and lest they lead us wrongly to a works-based understanding of salvation and righteousness. So let's see now the examination of works in the final judgment that we see Paul point us to. The first thing that we see in verses 7 and 10 are the works of the redeemed. He says the same thing twice, just in different ways. Verses 7 and 10, look at verse 7. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. Verse 10 there will be, basically picking up from the last verse, glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. Here in these verses, Paul is reminding us that true salvation is manifested in a believer's life by patience or by perseverance in doing good. And then he lists three things that the redeemed believer is seeking. Look at what he says, verse 7, who by patience and well-doing, number one, seek for glory. Above all, the highest and most wonderful desire of a believer is God's glory. Paul puts it like this in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. A believer not only seeks for God's glory first and foremost, but a redeemed believer also seeks for his own glory. Now, not in the, co- the way that is common to fallen humanity, not in a self-seeking glory, in a self-seeking way, but the redeemed believer genuinely looks forward to that day when we will share in God's glory on that day when our salvation is perfected. So we have a verse like Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So the, the redeemed believer, by patience and well-doing, seeks for this type glory, the glory of God and the glory that we will inherit with him in eternity. The redeemed believer, Paul says, secondly, seeks for honor. Again, not worldly honor, but the honor that comes from God, the the honor like that found in God saying as the master does in Matthew 25, 21, well done, good and faithful servant. And finally, the true believer seeks immortality. Immortality. 
that day when the perishable body will, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, put on the imperishable, and this mortal body put on immortality. MacArthur summarizes this like this. Paul is not discussing how a person comes to salvation or how God produces Christ-likeness in him. He's describing what the life of a true believer is like, pointing out that those divinely bestowed qualities will eventuate in the final glory of the divinely bestowed eternal life. You see, Paul's point in speaking in this way of the deeds of the redeemed is to show that a person who possesses the life of God will reflect the character of God, and that it is on the basis of that reflected godly character in the redeemed believer's life by grace, by the transformation of the Spirit, it is on that basis that on the day of judgment he will be judged. Listen to how MacArthur again puts it. I put this quote there in your handout. It will be on the screen. I thought it was such a good one to put there for you. He writes, Justification by faith alone does not negate the works of righteousness in the believer's life. Scripture makes clear that just as surely as we are saved by our faith, we will be judged by our works. When in sovereign grace God receives a sinner at the time of his conversion, he asks nothing but he believe in Jesus Christ and submit to him. But from that moment on, the believer enters into a responsibility of obedience and the mark of his new spiritual life becomes his obedience to God. Faith in Christ does not produce freedom to sin and to do as we please, but freedom from sin and a new God-given desire and capacity to do what pleases him. That's what Paul is pointing us to here in the works of the redeemed. We see, secondly, in verses 8 and 9, the works of the unredeemed. Look at those verses with me. But to those who are self-seeking, who do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, to the Jew first and also the Greek. The first and really most prominent underlying characteristic of the redeemed here that Paul points us to is that they are self-seeking. That is, everything the unredeemed does is for the purpose of pleasing and serving self. He says, secondly, that they do not obey the truth. The unredeemed person sees his way above all and above all else. In this act of divine treason, the unredeemed actively thwarts all that God would command and require of him and runs headlong into what pleases himself. And finally, he says that they actively obey unrighteousness. I love how one author puts it. He says, no person lives in a moral and spiritual vacuum. He's either godly or ungodly. He's either righteous or unrighteous. So, so Paul is saying here that the unredeemed actively obey unrighteousness is the natural outworking of the fact that they do not obey the truth, they do not submit to God's rule and reign in their life, and they seek and please self above all else. It, it, it kind of reminds me in, in a connected way of, of John's argument in 1 John 3, where John in this passage points us to the fact that you are either a child of God or you are a child of the devil. And so often we try to create this third category of people, this sort of carnal Christian category that has the saving work of Jesus applied to him, but whose life isn't submitted to the lordship of Christ. But the scripture knows no third category. John knows no third category. John in 1 John 3 makes it very clear, you are one or you are the other. And next time you're talking to your unbelieving family or friends, maybe at the Thanksgiving table, here in a few weeks, see how they respond to the truth that, biblically speaking, they are children of the devil. No one likes to be known as such. No one likes to admit to being such, even if they admittedly reject the lordship of Jesus in their life. That's exactly what John says there in 1 John 3. Listen to his argument. Verse 4, 1 John 3, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. No one who keeps, no one abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or know him. He's just pitting these back and forth against each other, right? Whoever 
practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. He goes on and on, verse 9, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And then verse 10 is the kicker. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. You see, John makes it clear in that passage, you are one or you are the other. And the evidence of which you are, a child of God or a child of the devil, is found by your obedience or your attitude toward sin and by your attitude toward obedience to God and his command, your attitude toward submitting your life to him, to his rule, to his reign, to a life of obeying him, of patience and well-doing, as Paul puts it here in Romans 2. Well, you see, this is the same sort of dichotomy that Paul is drawing here in Romans 2. The redeemed are those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory, honor, and immortality. The unredeemed are those who submit to self-rule and actively obey unrighteousness, actively live and pursue that which is contrary to God and his word. You are one or you are the other. There is no third category. MacArthur puts it like this, the road to hell is here very simply defined as the spirit of antagonism to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And what is the end for that group? Well, Paul says here in these verses, it is wrath, it is fury, it is tribulation and distress. It is eternal hell, as the rest of God's word makes it clear. And Paul's point here in these verses is that for those unredeemed, that judgment by works will be completely deserved. It will be a completely righteous and just judgment. As he's already made the case in chapter 1, no one will be without excuse. No one will be able to cry foul on that day of judgment. And he's making it clear now in chapter 2 that that same standard of judgment will be there, not only for the Greek, but also the Jew. Verse 11, which is going to lead us into the next passage we'll look at next week, for God shows no partiality. You see, Paul makes it clear here, God is no respecter of wealth or position or church affiliation or family background or any other thing you want to add into that blank. Now, on that day of judgment, none of those things will matter in the slightest. On that final judgment day, our lives will be examined and we will be judged righteously and fairly. Those who have been redeemed by God, through faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone, they will have a life of fruit wrought by the Spirit of God that will show a life of, by patience and well-doing, seeking for glory and honor and immortality, and as such, they will be granted eternal life. But those who have not placed their faith in Christ, those who continue in sinful selfish, rebellion against God, disobey the truth, obey unrighteousness, they will receive what their sin justly and rightly deserves. Eternal damnation, eternal separation from the blessing and goodness of God. Wrath and fury for all of eternity. So as we end our our time in this passage this morning, whatever else our passage teaches this morning, whatever other questions or confusions come to your mind as you think how to interpret the specific nature of what Paul is arguing here and link it together with the rest of God's word, I think one thing is abundantly clear and is immeasurably important to each and every one of us. And it's the thing that I want to leave you with this morning. When your life is over on this earth, when this present age is over on this planet, God will either give you eternal life or he will give you eternal wrath. You will either receive, in the language of this passage, glory and honor and peace, or you will receive tribulation and distress and wrath. Either heaven or hell awaits you when you die, and both will last forever. So the fundamental question for each of us to ask this morning is which will await you, and how do you know? Are you giving your mind and your energy and your, and your thoughts to consider these eternal matters, these eternal realities? 
You know, this passage should stir each of us to examine afresh this morning. Am I placing my faith and my trust and my hope in Christ and in Christ alone, in his finished work on our behalf? You see, it is only this finished work of Jesus on our behalf that can make us right and holy and grant us eternal life on that day of judgment. If you have been placing your trust in any amount of good works or religious deeds to make you right with God, I pray this morning that you would see the emptiness of that hope, that you would see the emptiness of that hope and that you would run and turn and place your faith in Christ this morning. Now, this passage should also, I believe, cause us to freshly examine our lives, to see if the deeds of our lives match the profession of our lips. Yeah, I certainly think we need to be careful not to misread Paul as saying that works need to be added to faith in order to make us right and able to stand before God on the day of judgment. That is clearly not the case, and we must be clear about that. But we equally must not allow our understanding of salvation by grace alone to diminish the challenge before us here. If the works of our hands are not changed and informed by the faith that we profess to possess, then it's right for us to ask if our faith is genuine and real in the first place. This is the command of Paul in Philippians 2.12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. So just as surely as you must not give way to any sort of works-based pursuit of salvation that thinks that anything but the finished work of Jesus on your behalf can save you, so equally we must not give way to believing in some sort of cheap grace, get out of hell free card mentality that thinks that we can receive Jesus as our savior and not submit to him as our Lord. You see, the follower of Christ will be progressively sanctified by the work of the Spirit, such that the follower of Christ produces a changed life, produces good works, produces an act of faith that can be characterized and categorized from Romans 2, verse 7, being patient in well-doing. So that is my prayer for each of us this morning, no matter your age, no matter if you're young and think that you have decades and decades before you, or no matter if you're an elderly saint and you don't know if this year or two might be your last on earth, no matter if you have followed Christ for 40 years or you have just given your life to Christ four months ago, I pray that we would all be equally stirred this morning to consider this final judgment to consider our faith in Christ, to consider how our lives are being actively changed through the work of the Spirit and through the power of the Word. And as we do so, I pray that our eyes would be lifted heavenward to consider Christ and his work on our behalf afresh as we come now to the table this morning to remember these things anew. Let's go to him now in prayer. Okay.